why. So guess what? We've got another takeover happening. We've got the details on that and a whole lot more on the Rebel's Edge. Stay tuned. Bang! Bang. <laughs> Where are you now? <laughs> uh, this doesn't look like Puerto Rico behind me. <laughs> it looks a little, it looks like it could still be a boat, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, I'm in New York, in the apartment in New York. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's my daughter's apartment in New York. And uh, here we are enjoying. Uh, and by the way, folks, that's Pete Nigerian. I'm John Nigerian. And uh, I would uh, like to give you guys a real quick story, Pete, about why I hate flying on commercial airlines. All right. Um, it's not that, you know, they don't treat me well. They treat me really well. But in this case, I didn't have a uh, first class seat because uh, basically, Pete, if there is a first class seat available, I get it um, because I'm about as high a flyer on American and United as you can be. <laughs> but if they buy them all out, <laughs> there's no place to go, right? So I take the next best. I take the exit row. So I'm sitting there in the exit row, and it is about two hours and 25 minutes from Miami to uh, New York. And gal comes in, sits next to me, next to the window. Her boyfriend comes in, or a significant other comes in, sits next to me. The guy got up you know, to go to the bathroom. And so I was nice enough, got up out of my seat, unhooked all my computer stuff, let him go to the bathroom, of course. And then five minutes after him, she has to go. So after he got all the way back in, then I have to get up again and blah, blah, blah. And it's not like I'm saying, oh, I'm a hero because I did that. That's what you do, right? <laughs> but this is also what you don't do, Pete. He went twice more to the bathroom <laughs> on a two and a half hour flight. What was he drinking? I was gonna say, dude, you should visit a doctor and figure out what's going on because, for the love of God, three times, and the last one, Pete, they basically had told us, okay, folks, 15 minutes from landing, you know, seat backs up, uh, put your tra tables down, you know, blah blah blah, right? <laughs> this guy gets up and goes again. I'm like, you couldn't hold it for 15 more minutes. You should have you should have told him you're a urologist and he has a problem. <laughs> you know, I'm a uh, doctor uh, rubber finger here. <laughs> I think I should do a little proctological exam. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was just dumb. And he was a nice enough guy. And each time he said, hey, I'm sorry. And maybe he has a condition, Pete. Good. I'm Good. thinking he does. Yeah. Because I've never, it wasn't like he was sitting there chugging beers or something at, on a 7 a.m. flight. So I don't know why he was getting up as often as he was, but it was a pain. Anyway, all right, that said, we've got lots of more interesting stories for you guys from the uh, 10X conference that we, mm -hmm. Pete and I attended last week. We'll share those with you tomorrow because I've wasted enough of your time. With the with John's macro plane flight minute, <laughs> but uh, let's get started, Pete. Macro right. minute. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say it's Jamie Dimon's 61 page letter. I always thought Warren Buffett wrote long letters, Pete. This one, it's like all of his thoughts are put down. But one of the big important ones is he says U.S. regulators uh, and how they treat banks. That relationship has deteriorated significantly. <laughs> That's what Jamie said. Yeah. Well, you know what else Jamie said, John? He said AI could be as consequential to the economy as electricity. That's a pretty yeah. interesting quote, right? I mean, this is this is a guy. Let's remember, you know, he's he's been a little more cautious. He's a little bit older, um, so you can understand whether it's Bitcoin and how he felt about that, or AI and how they felt, and now he's been embracing it. So. Good for him for being able to embrace a lot of this stuff as they go forward. I would say this, macro minute really, really quick for me, the 10-year, it can't, I mean, the fact that we got up cl close to 4.5% today, John, um, I think that speaks volumes. We had earnings kicking off here at the end of the week. Everybody's excited about that. We've got volatility. There's a lot going on. But that 10-year has got me a little bit concerned right now. It should. It should, and the market's whistling by the graveyard about it again, mm -hmm. Pete. 
Although, as I told Liz Clayman on Friday, um, the VIX closed at the highest level of the year on Thursday. Now it's come back down. And if you look at VIX today, it's down again. Mm -hmm. But let me not get too far ahead of myself and let's go to Fantastic Futures. Yeah. Fantastic Futures. So Fantastic Futures, man, gets another uh, curtain call for Bitcoin, Pete because Bitcoin rocking and rolling again. Yes, the halving is coming soon. It's based on how many coins are mined, folks, and it's approximately a four-year cycle at this point. But they are uh, going to get half the reward, the miners are, going forward, not as of today, but in a week. And ahead of that, a lot of people are buying Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin ETFs, or buying some of the stocks that are related to Bitcoin, Pete. Well, I would say this, um, my fantastic future, obviously silver and gold have had an incredible run to the upside, all time highs when you're looking at gold and that's been pretty incredible, but don't lose sight of something you've talked about, I've talked about, and we're gonna continue to talk about it because we talk about inflation all the time, we talk about crude, all this other stuff. How about cocoa and coffee? They mm -hmm. just continue to ramp, John, to the upside and it's about weather, it's about demand, there's a lot of different reasons, but. Both of them have absolutely taken off, and it's absolutely incredible to see what we're looking at right now. Coffee, right around two-year highs. It got up above 213 today, and then you look over at cocoa. Ah, it's only up 145% year-to-date. Oh, and by the way, 270% over the last year. So we're talking about some really major moves, and it's not just in the metals. It's in other things that we also obviously have a lot to do. It says a lot about inflation. And I think that's what we're seeing happening right now. It's what the Fed is not wanting to see is that inflation, how sticky it is. And it's not like it's just stopped, John. It's been going higher. So I think people really have to uh, put their seatbelts on and, and, and keep a little bit of an eye on this right now. Yep. Well, you are correct, Pete. Mm -hmm. um, Pete, let's talk about AIRC. Um, we don't talk about it much, but it's a nearly 6% dividend yielder. Uh, and it's in the REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust, REIT space. Blackstone apparently deciding they got to have it. They're going to pay $10 billion for it. And the stock explodes to the upside, Pete, up 22% so far today. Yeah, we're talking about upscale apartments. It's unbelievable. All cash deal, by the way, 25% premium also. 76 communities in 10 states. And they come in and they just say, you know what? We want it. We're not going to fool around. We're going to do an all cash deal. 39 bucks, a little bit higher than that. They traded over 12 million shares, John, in the first hour of the day. It normally trades significantly less than that. It's about 1 million per day. So this is really something pretty amazing. And I'll tell you what, people are convinced that this is just a done deal. Throw it out the window because it's done because it jumped to 39 almost immediately and it sat there the entire day. So I think this one is gonna be done very, very rapidly. It looks like Blackstone wanted them badly. They paid the 10 billion, they got it. Yep, and it's uh, a luxury homes is what they do, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and since it's a REIT, they're not selling those homes, of course. They are uh, apartments, uh, like Pete said. Uh, and that's why Blackstone wants them because they love that income. All right, let's talk, Pete, just a little bit, uh, maybe even a little bit more than a little bit on Coinbase, because just as we said, top of the show with the fantastic futures and so forth, um, there are a bunch of these cryptos that are getting the love again today because Bitcoin went from 65 last week to 72 today on that halving that we already covered. But Barclays is maintaining a sell on Coinbase, <laughs> um, so they haven't been doing real well with that call, but uh, to be shorted into the halving uh, as we get closer to it might not be a bad play, Pete, might not, because it still isn't as high as it just got to recently. Um, I'm seeing the same thing play out in uh, BITO or MicroStrategy or any of these, even though Bitcoin's pushing towards that record again, um, most of those stocks that track it are not. Yeah, that part's pretty interesting, especially when you look over at the miners. But I think with something that's transactional and we're talking about Coinbase here, 
I don't know, John. I look over and I see this Barclays guy, and sometimes I think these guys just want to dig their heels in even if they're wrong. And this guy, at least mm -hmm. right now, his price target, 179 Well, stock's trading 250 last I looked. So that's kind of a uh, – that puts him in a really bad spot. Now, it's going to take a heck of a correction to get back down to that price <laughs> that he's got out there right now. But it's interesting. I find it uh, incredibly interesting. Year to date, we're talking about Coinbase being up over 63%, John. So when you've got the kind of shorts that they've got, they've got 4 to 5% short. They've got free cash flow of a billion and a half. And then you look at cash to debt. Two billion, from a fundamental standpoint, looks pretty damn good. From from the the standpoint of does Bitcoin maybe have anything left in the tank? Sure, but even if it doesn't, I think we're going to see a lot going back and forth, a lot of trade going on there. I think that fits up pretty well with Coinbase, John. I do too, Pete. And uh, the more people uh, that gain exposure to coins directly rather than through an ETF, which quite frankly. You know, I'm, I'm sure your son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, whatever, or maybe even your grandmother and grandfather could show you how to open a, an account and buy crypto. I don't know why you'd do it through an ETF necessarily um, and incur those additional fees. Um, but Coinbase gets, of course, that transaction volume. Um, and they do a pretty good job, I must say. Brian, uh, you're doing a nice job. All right, Pete. Let's talk about Peri, P-E-R-I. This is uh, an Israeli ad tech firm. And we're going to, of course, talk about the U.S. listed or ADR, the shares, American depository receipt things. Um, they're saying that um, a move that Microsoft is doing with its Bing search engine, Pete, is going to hurt them because of the changes to advertising that you can do on there. And... Uh, that's a big drop out of this stock, a 39% drop. Wow. Um, that's erased a lot of market cap on this one today. Yeah, not only erasing it, but John, a lot of people participating in erasing this thing down to the downside of 35, 39%, whatever it might be. You know, it averages 500,000 uh, contra or excuse me, shares a day. It's traded 4.5 million today already. Mm. And all of this, I think, we're just literally just pointing at one thing, and it's Bing and how this changes things for them. It really is interesting. There are some shorts here, John. It's not a massive short position, but at some point, I would expect to see a little bit of buying back. There was about 4% of the, of the float out there and an outstanding of about 4%. I think it's a, a pretty good time to maybe consider, do you want to buy some of that back? And we might see that. So we might see this thing actually find a little bit of footing at some point, but it's an incredible drop. And literally it's all based upon that algorithmic move because of Bing. It's, it's scary actually. Yep. And uh, the way some of these programs work folks in these program trades or high frequency sorts of things is they hit a bid and if the bid doesn't firm up at all, they hit it again and hit it again and hit it again. You get the idea. They do the same to the upside. Uh, but as Pete and I say all the time, stocks do go down faster generally than they do go up. Um, and in this case, when you've got such a big partner, if you will, uh, obviously Microsoft doesn't own a piece of this Israeli company, but they're partners in that they run those ads on the Bing platform and that change is hurting them in a big way today. Yep. All right, let's talk about aerospace, Pete. This one, uh, defense supplier uh, DCO, they received an unsolicited non-binding takeover. And for that reason, the stock's up 15% today. Now, the 52-week uh, high was hit today, 57.52. You gotta believe they were squeezing a lot of shorts there, Pete, because it's come all the, uh, well, not all the way, It's it's two dollars off of that right now, so it's still up over seven bucks, but it was up over nine, and then it pulled back. What do you think of this one? And would you take a shot here uh, for a competing bid coming in, Pete? Or do you think, since this was unsolicited and it's non-binding and all that kind of verbiage, Pete, um, it might be that somebody else in the space says, you know what, we were kind of taking a look at this. Maybe their hand is uh, forced to jump in as well. 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all, John. I think the most amazing part about this company, it's a 175-year history company. So this isn't just something that just popped up 20, 30 years ago, and now all of a sudden it's got this move. I mean, this is a long-term play. It's innovative. It's got a lot of different elements that make it something that could be attractive. And when, the, when you're looking at an expense side of it, John, in today's world, you're underneath a billion dollars. This is an $880 million takeout would, would be where this is. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little competition there. By the way, I think it's really important to point out something that you were kind of alluding to earlier when we were talking about the apartments. We were talking about Blackstone and the $10 billion deal. You know, the $10 billion transactions are were very strong in Q1. And I bring that up because we weren't seeing that kind of thing happening at all in 2023. We get into 2024, and now we're right back where we had been. And the $500 million group, John, pre-pandemic, we're, we're right there. We're in line. We're doing just fine. The acquisitions that we are seeing are just accelerating. Shoot, we've got two of them just today that we're talking about. And we've seen many, many of these, whether it's in biotech or whatever, we're seeing a lot of this. So I think it's something that we, we it tells you a little something about the economy, maybe. And, and if that's the case, uh, maybe we shouldn't be quite as concerned about the recession idea or whatever that everybody wants to throw out there constantly. We've already been through the <laughs> at least one recession, and it wasn't that bad because a lot of people don't even want to fess up to it. So I, I would say that it's one of those things where Take it easy, everybody. Take a deep breath. We're not in a depression, and we are seeing a lot of this activity going on in the first quarter of 24. Well, and uh, when Pete said that this is over 100 and whatever, 60 years or whatever, that the company's been around, one of the things that they really kind of hung their hat on, Pete, other than various types of electromagnetic stuff that end up uh, as we develop the aviation industry, they end up in... Uh, the airplane cockpits and all that. The other thing, aluminum. I mean, these guys provided the aluminum for freaking Charles Lindbergh for his <laughs> flight across the Atlantic, folks, when he flew New York to Paris. Um, but th th this is a company that's been around for quite a while, and it'll be interesting to see them, uh, what exactly happens. This is a PE firm taking them out, if they take them out. Mm -hmm. And I think, Pete, that uh, it'll be back in the market after the PE firm works some of its magic, if indeed yeah. they get them. All yeah. right. Well, what do you want to talk about in terms of sports and so forth today, Pete? Can't be yeah. anything about uh, Final Four, can it? <laughs> we got a little Final Four, but we're not going where you think. I'm not going with the men. The men, we can't even find them, John. 9.30 tonight, they're going to play the championship game over on TBS. Really? Mm. That's what we've decided to do. Anyway, all that being said, how about the ladies, though? I mean, the women's tournament was unbelievable. It was record-breaking. You had, obviously, all the folks that wanted to see either fall or fall down or, or maybe rise up, but Caitlin Clark certainly was a storyline. They had 14 million people watching the last couple of games, John. So it says a lot about women's basketball and the knowledge that people are gaining and everything else. But I kind of wanted to hit on one thing outside of Iowa. Forget Iowa for a second. First of all, being a Minnesota guy, I'm saying forget Iowa no matter what. But South Carolina, is this truly a dynasty? And I'm going to say yes. <laughs> Dawn Staley, the coach there, she's only 53 years old, John. She's got three Olympic gold medals as a player. She's got another one as a coach. She's been at South Carolina for quite some time. I think 2008 is when she got there. John, here's the record in the last five years. 32 and one, 26 and five, 35 and two, 36 and one, and 38 and zero this year. Undefeated all the way through. So you want to talk about somebody who's doing it right and doing it as a dynasty? They don't slip underneath this woman. They they play even better every game. They outshot Iowa. They out-rebounded them almost by a double. They had 51 rebounds to 29 for Iowa. So it tells you a little something about how they play, how they approach every single game. By the way, their record for five years, 167 and nine. I would say that this puts her into the category of the New England Patriots in the early 2000s, the Pittsburgh Steelers in the middle uh, or to the early 1970s, San Francisco in the 1980s, the Packers going all the way back to the 1960s, Kansas City now. 
I think they're even a bigger dynasty than any of those. I mean, this is – you want to talk about a team that goes in, a school that goes in, and they literally just light you up, it's South Carolina. And, and I had no – that one of the reasons why it wasn't even an interesting game for me to go over and watch was I just knew they were going to win. And I knew they'd blow them out by a pretty decent number. They beat them by 12 points. I mean, this was the game of games, and Iowa still couldn't even match up with them. And I'll tell you, a lot of players on that team at South Carolina, and I think she's going to continue on and on and on. 53 years old, John, this is going to be a dynasty for the next seven to 10 years. Well, she obviously, she played the game herself, Pete. Um, love coaches that do that. And, you know, easily, uh, I believe, a majority of coaches play the game that they're coaching. Um, even little guys like Belichick and even little guys like Lou, uh, your, your pal, Pete, Lou Holtz, um, tried to play. Um, yeah. But I can't remember. Did he play at Holy Cross or uh, something? William and Mary. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm getting off track. But... Yeah, I agree. Um, Staley, great coach, great player in college, um, two national championships in the last three years. I, I still love uh, all the things that Caitlin Clark did for women's basketball. Yep. Um, and Staley gave her a lot of credit, Pete. She said, I want to personally thank Caitlin Clark for lifting our, up our sport. Mm -hmm. um, she said she carried a heavy load. She's going to lift the WNBA up too. You're one of the goats of our game. And keep in mind, she could have gone to UConn. She, yep. Caitlin Clark, that is. She could have gone to South Carolina. She was the top player um, when she came out of high school, and she elected to stay in Iowa. Yeah. So um, very, very impressive. And I'm not taking anything away from um, South Carolina. They deserve it. They got it. And like you said, Pete, they got a young team and a young coach. So they could be around a long time. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're doing something really, really right there. And I agree with you uh, as far as Caitlin staying in Iowa and being a part of that and building it. That's really, really impressive. And she's done it year after year after year. She could have stayed one more year. She will she would make more money next year off NIL than she will in the WNBA, John. So it oh, yeah. gives you a little bit of an idea of the kind of money, $3 million versus about 250 Well, but she'll get some money also for the ads. So <laughs> she'll, it's not just the WNBA money. It's also the ads that these kids do, and it's, it's amazing what they can get. John, you're Chicago Bears. I want to throw this out to you because I know you still follow them closely, and if I were the GM, you'd be pretty happy, I think, with me, but we'll see. I would say this. Do not trade your picks. You have the number one pick. You also have the number nine pick. Kind of reminiscent of last year, uh, a team that people started to understand a little something about, the Houston Texans. We already talked about they built something that is young. Their salary, because everybody is so young there, John, their salary cap is a whole lot different than everybody else as well. Now, at some point, they're going to have to pay the pony. But as of right now, when you look at that team, they had I think they might have been the, the team that had the most money to spend, and they spent it. I think they spent $165 million of guaranteed money this past offseason already. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of what you can do when you've got players that are first-year guys, second-year guys. They did a great job in the draft last year. I think if your Chicago Bears don't put their head up their own backside, I think that they could do pretty well with the quarterback. Personally, I'd go with Jaden Daniels rather than who they're going to probably pick. But also, why not go for a receiver? just to give the quarterback somebody to throw to that, you know, is is going to be great along with what they've already done, which is Keenan Allen, which they just picked up, and they already had a great trade with Carolina for another receiver that was there last year. They did a lot in the offseason signing players, the right players, and they, they, they got all these picks in the first round, right, the two picks. They don't get very many more picks in this particular draft, John, so – they got to do it right. I think they'll do it right. But Chicago was 7 and 10. It's not like they were 1 and 14, 16, whatever, right? Yeah. So I think this makes it really, really interesting the fact that this is a 7 and 10 team that could get a great quarterback, hopefully for their sake, and a great wide receiver to add to what they've got. They've signed some tight ends. Chicago Bears could be back. Yeah, they could, Pete. Um, 
And, uh, you know, longtime Chicago Bear fans will know that they'll probably screw it up. Um, <laughs> but they sure could. They could go out and get somebody who might be in the C.J. Stroud category, somebody who might be in the Will Anderson discussion, because they could go for a defensive player, too. Sure. There's those two receivers out of LSU, Pete. Um, so they could pick up one of those and a great defensive player um, in the second round or whatever. But, man, um, I think you're exactly right. Uh, and we're, this is one of the reasons Pete will be a general manager someday, folks. Um, he's interviewed a couple times. Oh. <laughs> and uh, is that if you have a veteran who's not in their rookie contract, that's where they get expensive. A rookie contract is cheap. A rookie contract is like a top rookie pick is probably 24 million bucks or something like that, Pete. And that's not all one season. That's four mm -hmm. years. I mean, you know, so that's one of the reasons these guys are kind of ticked when they come out because the veterans negotiated away their upside mm -hmm. by saying, okay, well, rookie, we're going to have a salary cap on rookies. Veterans, no salary cap, <laughs> anything you can get. And <laughs> some of that is because of, you know, Matthew Stafford, Pete, and some of the other guys who are coming out um, who were getting $60, $70 million deals as a rook when the veterans weren't getting that. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, long story short, uh, the Bears probably will screw it up. Um, <laughs> and there's so many red flags around Caleb, Pete. Uh, even though he's a great player, I would do what you said. I would take Daniels. They're not going to yeah. do it. Um, so... I, we just got to cross our fingers and hope that those red flags like him, you know, his leadership skills, if you want to call him that in those mm -hmm. last six games, that was pathetic. Yeah. Um, but, you know, everybody thinks that he should be the guy. Only a few of us think that maybe he should fall a little further down in the draft, but he's not going to. I'll tell you a guy who might have fallen a little bit further down, but I, don't, I, I wouldn't be as concerned about it. But Tavondre Sweat, that giant defensive tackle for Texas. Here's why. Had a DWI last night. Not so great. You know, that's the one thing you just got to do everything smart. You got to do it by the book. You don't want to be getting arrested for anything, let alone, you know, driving intoxicated. Um, but if he slips anywhere, John, that might be a guy that, you know, I think if I, Look, I'm not saying you go after the renegades or the guys who do things wrong or whatever, but, you know, I'm sure he's learned his lesson. I hope he's learned his lesson. I would probably call him up if I was a GM and say, hey, look, do you get the fact that you are in, in the media every single day under anything that you do that's wrong and try to at least wake him up a little bit? But in any case, that big boy can play. And uh, oh, yeah. if he does slide to anybody for any reason like that, I think that that would be a good move to snap him up. That's another thing that Pete's remembering, folks, from one of his teammates, Warren Sapp. Yeah. Because I remember, Pete, that Sapp, they had, there was a big rumor flying around that he had a, a cannabis problem, and he dropped in the draft, and Tampa Bay got him, and that guy never looked back. And literally nobody stopped him while he was a pro. They I didn't mean, call it cannabis back then either, John. They just called it pot. <laughs> <laughs> that's right uh, well uh we hope you guys enjoyed the show uh tell your friends about the rebel's edge uh we'll be doing some announcements with grant cardone and a bunch of the cool folks that we were out there with we'll tell you a little bit about peyton manning and mike tyson and uh tyler perry and a lot of the cool folks that were there with us but That'll be a future show, so stay tuned for that. Tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll see you then, folks. Bang.